Hi guys, welcome back to Switch Up. A big thanks to all the new subscribers that we've had, and remember we do give away a free Nintendo Switch game each and every month to the subscriber most active on the channel. Today we're going to look at Subnautica Below Zero, and this acts as a sequel of sorts to 2014 Subnautica. I say 2014 because that's when it was originally released back on Windows. It was developed and published by Unknown Worlds, and once again it's built on the Unity engine. However, there's lots visually that wasn't in the first game, so how does the Switch hold up when it struggled slightly with the first title? Let's hope the performance doesn't score below zero. Is it a worthy sequel? Let's find out. The story this time follows your main protagonist who arrives at planet 4546b investigating the passing of her sister, or so you're led to believe. As with the first game, you'll soon encounter the architects, and there are many alien life forms and stories which you'll uncover. In an improvement over the first game, the narrative drive is a little more clear, and there's more in the way of exposition through notes and audio recordings that you'll find throughout the world. Hi, you. How's everything at Pengling Central? <laughs> oh, fine. At certain moments, it gave me Promethean vibes, and the alien structures and rectilinear design, while a clear juxtaposition to some of the underwater scenes, are equally imposing. As with the first game, you'll find four different options for gameplay. You can choose Survival, which has the health, hunger, thirst, oxygen and temperature to take care of, or the freedom mode, which removes hunger and thirst. There's a sadistic hardcore mode, which gives you just one life. And then there's creative, for those players that like to go in and base build and do all that fun stuff, without any of the risks of death. Just as with the first game, you'll be stranded on your own, but this time, your base will be beneath the waves. Right off the bat, I have to point out one thing that irritates me. This might seem completely pathetic, but the fact that you enter your base through a side door, I just, um... How, how does that work exactly with the pressure of the water pushing against it? And how doesn't it fill up with water when you... Yeah, I just... Yeah, it should have been underneath. Other than that, the gameplay is centered around the same basic mechanics. You'll have your fabricator from which you can craft any items or recipes that you've discovered. Once you've built your scanner, you'll go off into the frozen tundra, scanning any discoveries and fragments of technologies. And once those prerequisite amounts have been met, you can then create them fully if you've got the components. The real and most obvious obvious difference this time round comes from the environment itself. The frozen world provides many challenges, and it's not all just aesthetic. The icebergs on the surface afford a real claustrophobia when you've dived down and you're just about to run out of oxygen, only to look up to the surface and see that actually there's no clear way to get air. is a real panic-inducing and visceral experience. The weather effects on the surface are much improved over the original game. These can cause your player to begin to freeze over time, and much of Below Zero is actually spent above water. There are a variety of different creatures to discover, and some of my most terrifying moments in gaming have come from these first encounters. Oftentimes, you will hear them before you see them, and when a game can induce a fight or flight reaction in its players, you know it's doing something right. There's nothing quite like having a small amount of oxygen left, only to be chased into an underground cave. <laughs> or trying to precariously work your way through a literal minefield of jellyfish. Once again, Subnautica thrives in the variability of its different biomes and the challenges each of those provide. There's a stark beauty to this underwater world, but unlike the first game where you broke the waves and felt a euphoric sense of safety, this time round when you break the waves, you begin to freeze to death, and that safety and comfort comes from beneath. Survival enthusiasts will be used to being dropped in at the deep end, but even then there's the potential for some frustration frustration when initially starting out. You're given so little guidance that it's likely that most players will experience some small roadblocks. For me, it was the discovery of one small scanning component that I just couldn't find anywhere to allow me to build the more advanced vehicles. I had unlocked almost every other item in the game, but I didn't have that and it was seriously hindering my progress, not to mention making me really slow underwater, which was upsetting. There are a number of very cool additions to this game which would be seriously spoilery to show you. Let's just say Remote Control Penguin may be one of the greatest things ever added to a computer game. I have felt slightly torn about the decision to include more on-land areas. The original Subnautica left me feeling so stranded and alone. Something about having all these areas to quickly jump out of the water initially took away some of that fear. 
when I realized that the developers had actually made an inverse reality by making out of the water the most dangerous place, I couldn't help but be impressed. The controls have once again included quite a bit of customization. You can change the bindings of buttons, set a run toggle and tweak sensitivities. You won't find any gyroscopic aiming, which in my opinion is a shame, but it's not a game that you particularly need it. This isn't a first person shooter. Gameplay has been slightly hindered by some of the performance issues I've experienced, which we'll go into in the next segment. But overall, it's such an enjoyable experience if you are a survival game fan. Some of the enemy AI is a touch questionable, particularly those on land, but it feels minor in the grand scheme of things. Gameplay scores 17 out of 20, and the controls, while good, also are affected by some performance issues. They score 15 out of 20. In many ways, Subnautica Below Zero is a much more attractive game than the first. The underwater scenes have got way more detail the specular lighting is more realistic, there are better shadows, there's less popping as you move around, and the draw distance seems improved. Unfortunately, this all takes a rather large toll on the frame rate. While the developers are clearly targeting 30 FPS, there seems to be an issue in docked mode where the frame pacing is all over the place. You can see on the graphs here how inconsistent it becomes, and that tends to be when it drops below 30, and it's quite noticeable on screen. If you're building bases or visiting any of the land areas, this becomes more pronounced. Once again, there are times when it's absolutely fine, but I'd say this is worse performance than the first game, with much of your time being played at around about 26 to 27 frames per second. However, once again, I don't know if this is just the Unity engine, but playing in handheld is much more pleasant. The image remains more crisp, the frame rate and frame pacing seem to be more consistent. It just makes no sense to me. Perhaps the resolution is dropped to the level where it increases that in performance but you can't see visually with the eye, but it really does look sharper and it plays better. The textures overall of the image are higher than that of the first game, but they still remain reasonably low. It's the lighting where this one looks so much better than the first game. And some of those effects, like the hailstones pushing down through the water, like the bullets in Saving Private Ryan, it looks very cool indeed. And the weather in general is a real star of the show this time round. As far as the audio and sound design go, once again, composer Ben Prunty has excelled himself. There's nothing in your face about the soundtrack here. For 60% of your time, the soundtrack is the environment itself, which is such a good choice in a survival game. And it also means that when a musical track kicks in, it has so much more weight and impact than it would have done otherwise. I've only seen it done this well in something like Death Stranding. And that's a game that I really loved, so that's a real compliment. Directional audio is all represented well on Switch, and the fidelity of the sounds has been carried over nicely. A final note on performance then, I have experienced a crash, and I've also glitched through the world and fallen into the void on two occasions, which is too too many, if you ask me. If that's my experience, then it tends to be that other players have a worse one, or at least spread over the whole community. We end up with lots of people with crashes and issues such as that. So it may be worth waiting for another patch. As it stands, I give visuals and performance 12 out of 20, and the audio is second to none. It scores 20 out of 20. Just as with the first game on Switch, Subnautica Below Zero is £24.99, but if you, if you can pick it up right now, it's £22.49, which represents a 10% reduction. Personally, I would have liked them to release both games at a slightly reduced rate, but you can pick them both up for £24.99, which is actually a decent price. Despite the performance issues I've had, I think overall it's a better designed game. There are UI improvements, you can pin recipes, the beacon system's more streamlined, and overall, that's my experience, more streamlined. Now, when you're thinking of value, you do have to take into consideration performance, and it certainly needs a patch, but hats off to the developer. They've included a lot of options for Switch users. Things like being able to rescale the UI for handheld mode, and the handheld mode in general is really good on Switch, it's just going to need a little bit more work. Overall, I give value 16 out of 20. 
Subnautica Below Zero is once again a terrifying and enjoyable experience. Performance isn't where it needs to be, and if that's your determining factor, then you might want to wait for a patch, but the core game underneath is excellent and well worth your time if you can look past some of the performance issues. It scores a switch up score of 80%. Let me know in the comments, will you be picking these games up? Are you interested in them? Or maybe this is your first survival experience. If it is, good luck. For all things Switch, oh, big thanks to our patrons. You guys are amazing. You support us each and every month. For all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers, guys. See ya.